there's low levels of exposure that used to be tolerated or tolerated by other people, result in manifestation of symptoms, and the symptoms improve or even go away completely when you remove yourself from the things that triggered it. And the responses occur to multiple chemically unrelated substances, and the symptoms involve multiple organs. So we have this environmental hypersensitivity unit that, or did have, it ran out of funding, that was connected with, with the clinical arm, uh, which is the environmental health clinic at Women's College Hospital, where, where I work. She took those different parameters and all the definitions that are out there and tested them. And she found the same case criteria. She tested them, so they call it discriminatory validity. It's really fancy doctor talk. It basically means it, it, that it discriminates people with chemical sensitivity over and over and again. It's very active and very sensitive. All the things that I showed you in the previous slide, the same case criteria found. She tested them and validated them as reliable and sensitive. And often you'll hear, you look at the literature, you'll say, oh, you know, they can't even define this stuff. And there'll be a citation. And if you look at the citation and you look that one up, this guy's saying, yeah, well, they can't define it. Well, but nobody's mentioned the fact that, yes, you can, and it's been published. They also found, when we did this, there's a stronger sense of smell than other people, and this is a new phenomenon, like only since the development of the illness. Difficulty concentrating, feeling dull or groggy, feeling spacey, all different kind of ways of describing the same thing, but they were all listed there, and they all repeatedly showed up. So the most common thing we see in chemically sensitive people uh, and I'm sure you'll all vouch for me, is facing stupid. Common triggers, volatile organic compounds, fragrances, perfumes, solvents, you guys know this stuff, cleaning products, carpets, the same things over and over that we see um, in, in this talk, all of these chemical pollutants, they're all structurally different, but they all seem to trigger off this response. That's called multiple chemical sensitivity, environmental sensitivity, or environmental hypersensitivity. 80% are middle-aged women between ages 30 to 64. The brain and all common system involved. Cognitive complaints, most common. Fatigue's very common. Chronic pain's common. When I'm listing these things, I'm not telling you things you don't know. I'm telling you that this is what the medical literature shows. Mood changes. Very acute sense of smell. Migraines are more common. Upper and lower respiratory symptom complaints very common. That's you know, tied for second place. Irritable bowel syndrome tied for second place with the respiratory symptoms. Irritable bowel syndrome, reflux, allergies are more common. Frequently have food sensitivities, immune systems involved. Environmental hypersensitivity, no proof. Defies the traditional dose response toxicology. The toxicologists say this is impossible. It doesn't fit. <coughs> guys show marked avoidance behaviors. Well, you know, people with agoraphobia do that too. Mood alteration. Well, all the nut bars are moody. Autonomic nervous system symptoms. So what is that? Well, the autonomic nervous system is the part of the nervous system that controls basic body functioning. So, for example, uh, um, there's two parts. There's sympathetic parasympathetic. So the sympathetic is the part that stimulates you. So if you're going to run away from a tiger and your heart is pumping and your sweat glands open up to control the body temperature and the lungs open up and you're running like crazy, well, then your digestion and your bladder function and so on, all that stuff kind of slows down. Whereas if you're quiet, it's the opposite. So when we see this autonomic nervous system symptoms, we'll see palpitations. we we'll see cold hands, cold feet, red ears, blotchy red skin coming and going so that the balance of the autonomic nervous system in the skin, for example, is just off. So you also see with multiple chemical sensitivities, unexplained pain, disturbed sleep, unexplained chronic fatigue, more physical symptoms without phys medical explanations. A psychiatric diagnosis is more likely. And there can be two reasons for that. One is because it increases the chances of you being sensitive to other things in the environment, and the other is that you've been misdiagnosed. It must be stress. So is it physical or mental? Here's your answer. It's physical or mental. Stress is a biological response to a noxious, demanding, or unpleasant mental tension, it may, or body tension. And it may be a factor in disease causation. This seems very complex what I'm saying here because the term stress has been misappropriated by the general population to mean I have some psychosocial issue. The kids say, I got a lot of stress, I have a project due next Wednesday. 
but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's initiated by psychosocial causes. There's a physiological response to the stressor, the fight or flight phenomenon. And it takes place in the brain. So this fancy thing here, the hypothalamus and pituitary are glands in the brain. They stimulate the adrenal. The adrenaline comes out. You're running away from the tiger. That's the fight or flight phenomenon. That's the stress response biologically. And it involves another way of doing it is that you can go through the, the, the nerves uh, um, directly to the adrenal glands and stimulate it that way too. So there's different pathways. So what do you get? You get adrenaline, you get steroids. And in the brain, it occurs in an area of the brain called the limbic system. <coughs> this orange part here, this is the cortex. Humans have the biggest cortex. So when I stand up here and I tell you that what's wrong with you who have chemical sensitivity is that you're ugly and stupid and that's why you've got this illness, you're probably just sitting there listening to me and hopefully not getting mad and no one's gotten up and stormed out or called the police and, and, and so on because you're interpreting what I said in the context that it's meant to be silly. And you didn't get a stress response, I hope. Okay. But the, so the cortex though reads the environment. You may see me as very threatening and annoying since I haven't shut up since I got up here. And so that can be a physiological response. So the cortex certainly reads the environment. But the fact that you might get a stress response occurs, I can name this, here, the limbic system. I just want to show you these things. They're called olfactory bones. And what's, I stole this from the internet too. So what I couldn't find is a connection from here to here, but it exists. The olfactory bulb is where all the nerve endings from the olfactory nerve in your nose go directly to your limbic system. And the purpose of that is to smell danger, to smell, find your food, to smell animals in heat, to find your way home. That's how we're built. We just don't do that much anymore because we have a cortex and other kinds of ways of, of, of reading the environment, but that's how we're built. So what's this limbic system for? It's the part of the brain responsible for survival. It's where the stress response takes place. It's where the hypothalamus and pituitary, pituitary glands exist. And chronic stimulation of the limbic system leads to hypervigilance. In other words, if you keep stimulating it, it gets wired. And it leads to the increased likelihood of being sensitized to other stressors. The purpose of it, survival, adaptation to the environment. It reads the environment, prefrontal cortex, as I explained to you, the psychosocial perception of what's going on in your environment. Humans have the largest prefrontal cortex, but there's also light. Birds know to fly south in the winter because there's less hours of sunlight. They don't check the calendar. Seasonal affective disorder. Certain people, the brain function can be affected significantly enough to actually cause clinical depression just because there isn't enough light and one treatment for it is to get a special light. Sound. There's a big difference in how I feel if I listen to Brahms or I listen to rap. Guess which one makes me feel better? Touch. So I have to explain touch. Many women in the audience here, many of you have probably had children. And so you went to prenatal classes and they taught you those breathing exercises. And hands up of all you women where the breathing exercises actually help reduce the pain. None. They've been teaching it for 40 years. Why? Because when you get a powerful pain and it goes up to the limbic system because it's a way we read the environment, there is a powerful stress response and a tremendous release of energy. And what you do for 14 hours then is you go, God, that hurts! Well, you can't do that for 14 hours. So they teach you these breathing exercises. It's just a relaxation technique. So you don't expend the energy. So after 14 hours, you have enough left to push the baby out. And that's why they teach it. Touch is a powerful way of stimulating the limbic system. Sense of smell, we already went through that. Limbic system, taste, so we know whether things are good or bad. Immune system. The immune system reads the environment constantly. It's reading it on a molecular level. It's looking for bad guys to protect you, like viruses. It's not looking for ragweed, but it's doing that a lot more now and reacting adversely because it's nuts. So, survival adaptation environment is a role, the stress response, the autonomic nervous system, it's also involved in sleep. So we know to go to sleep when the hours of light are, um, sorry, not the hours of light, when the light is, is gone, we're supposed to go to sleep. We have a clock in the limbic system that tells us to do that. It's a necessary thing for survival. It kind of gets messed up when we move to Japan. Mood. Mood is 
Posted link, I'll be sitting there in the system. Cognition and memory. If I threaten to kill you with my gun, it may take 30 seconds. It's like a police show. And as I'm about to pull the trigger, the police shoot me dead. You need a psychiatrist for a year after that, even though it's only 30 seconds, and you will never forget this face. If I ask you for the time, and it takes 30 seconds, 30 seconds later, you don't remember it happened. So short-term memory is very important to learn things and store that stuff into the long-term memory filing cabinet, survival and adaptation in the environment is very closely linked to cognition and short-term memory. So it's pain, as I mentioned, sense of smell, and also it's the part of the brain where the blood-brain barrier is already the weakest because it needs to communicate with the rest of the body. The immune system has been demonstrated to also provoke stress responses in the limbic system when it's reacting to something in the environment and vice versa. So when the limbic system is hypervigilant, what can do that? Childhood trauma. If you grew up in a home where the parent was less than acceptable, then you grow up learning this. The most important people in my life maybe shouldn't be trusted or depended on as well as they should be. And so you pattern things in your brain, not just that cognition, but you pattern limbic system hypervigilance to watch it and be careful. So you're more likely to have a hypervigilant limbic system based on childhood trauma. Generalized anxiety makes sense. Chronic stress, and sometimes life sucks, and it's not your fault. There's all kinds of things going on. People around you are sick or dying or whatever it may be, or there's a flood. Chronic stress can lead to limbic system hypervigilance. So can depression. Post-traumatic stress disorder. The stress may not be, be um, chronic, but it may have been major. You survive a plane crash, or you're a veteran from, from Afghanistan. These, a lot of these guys come home with post-traumatic stress disorder. They have limbic system hypervigilance. Borderline personality disorder is a psychiatric disorder, but it, it, these people are hypervigilant for their environment. People with chronic pain, wow, they have limbic system hypervigilance. If you got run over by a bus or you've got rheumatoid arthritis, you're more likely to have limbic system hypervigilance just based on the fact that you've got a chronic pain disorder. Chemical exposures can lead to limbic system hypervigilance. And once it's hypervigilant, then you can interchange the stressors. It's just a lot more easy to provoke a stress response. So this is a sensitization of stress and how to make someone crazy. And when I explain this in my practice and most of my patients are women, they say, I can make you crazy two ways. I can threaten to kill you with my gun. It only takes a few seconds. Or I can marry you and do it more slowly. <laughs> sensitization occurs from toxic or repeated exposure in susceptible individuals. Animal studies of limbic system sensitization. <coughs> Repeated exposure to chemicals which can cause changes in brain function at higher doses can cause sensitization in the brain so that the brain reacts to a lower threshold. Animal studies have shown this. Fungicides, herbicides, insecticides, solvents, VLCs, and formaldehyde. They do things to the gene pool in rats to make rats that are a certain way for research purposes, and companies that do this and sell it to various research labs. So they've got these rats that are genetically programmed to be sensitive to organophosphate pesticides. They're more easily sensitized to other chemicals. They show hypersensitive receptors in the respiratory and gastrointestinal. So what's a receptor? A receptor is like a receiver of a message. So here's a great example. Um, I always have them as much estrogen in me as most of you women do, or did. So, but if you give me estrogen now, I will grow breasts and I will grow them on my chest because the tissues around my nipples have receptors for estrogen. I just don't have very much. But I won't grow breasts on my forehead because there are no estrogen receptors up there. So receptors receive messages of chemicals. And animals, the, the rats are genetically programmed in this fashion have hypersensitive receptors in the respiratory and gastrointestinal system. Similar patients with multiple chemical sensitivities. Animals sensitized to a chemical are more easily sensitized to other chemically unrelated substances. That's what they said. Now there's the canaries in the coal mine. This is the theme of today's show. And so this canary's got a, a gas mask on because he's going into the coal mine. The coal mines in the olden days they didn't have any ventilation systems. And so what the miners did is they bring a canary with them in a cage because they're very sensitive to gases like methane and carbon monoxide. So as long as the canary kept singing, the miners knew the air supply was safe. When the uh, canary in the coal mine became uh, uh, the source of warning the miners um, because they stopped singing, um, then they knew they were in imminent danger. So what's this got to do with multiple chemicals?